as I mentioned in the previous lecture, the Romans had a very eclectic culture, and this is reflected in its art. They were influenced mainly by the Etruscans and the Greeks in the beginning, but they assimilated and transformed these characteristics for their own purposes. So in this lecture, I would like to ask the question, what did they borrow? How did they borrow it? And how did they transform it? I think there's no better example to see how the Romans borrowed other cultures' um, architecture than looking at a typical Roman temple. And here I'm showing you the Temple of Fortuna Virilis, built during the Republican period around 75 BCE. Temples were a necessary part of Roman life. Uh, they approached religion as a civic duty. Like the Greeks, they had a pantheon of gods that were actually the same cast of characters of the Greek pantheon, just with different names, and with the addition of a few other gods. For example, the god Janus, the two-faced god, or the goddess Fortuna, uh, the goddess of fortune, and then the addition of the imperial gods. And these are the emperors that, um, after they died, would be part, considered part of an imperial cult. And so Romans, as good citizens, were expected to participate in rituals and make offerings to the pantheon of gods and the imperial cult. Um, this was, uh, they didn't mind other religions being practiced as well, um, but you needed to, as a Roman, take part in these uh, rituals. This was only, of course, a problem for um, monotheistic religions like Christianity or Judaism that believed in only one God, and this resulted in very bloody, bloody persecutions later on. So a temple uh, was a expression of this eclecticism in Rome because it was meant to absorb all of the people and cultures within it. If we look at the Temple of Fortuna Virilis, it's clear that it is borrowing from both the Greeks and the Etruscans. It's a rectangular plan, much like the Parthenon, and it um, on its uh, exterior we see a series of columns that are borrowed from the Greek Ionic order. However, like the Etruscan temple, we see an axial approach in which a series of stairs takes us up to a porch with an overhang and the back of the temple is a solid wall that encloses a cella in which an imperial or um, a cult deity would be, uh, uh, would be housed. Unlike the Etruscan temple, however, there would be friezes along the entablature, um, a continuous frieze as is appropriate for an Ionic temple and possibly in the pediment. This is closer to the Greek temple. So essentially we have a combination of both of these temples to create a, um, a Roman temple. You'll notice that the Greek columns, although we can uh, definitely identify them by their capitals and the base and the fluting, are merely decorative in the back. And this is one thing that the Romans do, is they loved the Greek orders, but they used them mostly as decorative elements, not as structural elements. The Romans also were incredible engineers, and they exploited the possibilities of the arch to widen the span between two columns. So the post and lintel structure had a weakness in the center. You could only 
separate two columns to a certain extent before there was a weakness in the lintel. A the arch was able to push the weight out towards the sides and allow for a greater span in between. This meant that um, they could create great bridges and aqueducts that would allow their um, empire to expand. The Romans also used the new material of concrete uh, that would allow them to move away from structural supports like columns and actually mold interior space. They could construct a wooden frame and then pour concrete into it and really create any interior space they liked. It also meant that they weren't as reliant on skilled labor because they didn't have to cut stone. They could essentially have teams of unskilled labor supervised by engineers or architects, and this would allow for cheaper uh, building projects. So to sum up, there are three major characteristics to remember when thinking about Roman architecture. First, they transformed the Greek structural orders into decorative elements, and this is important mainly in temple architecture. We see the Greek columns there, but mostly they are not used to hold up the structure. They are not weight-bearing, but are usually used as decorative elements. Second, they exploited the capabilities of the arch in order to create um, bridges and aqueducts and um, structures that create that um, needed uh, wide spans between two structural elements. And third, they exploited the possibilities of concrete to create and mold new and large um, interior spaces.